Millions of people die of starvation, while grains rot in storage silos to create artificially high prices for maximum profit. So it's not true to say that there is a food crisis. Rather, there is a crisis in distribution and utilization of the world's resources. The progressive utilization theory, or Prout, has been created to address these gross imbalances, as well as many other local and global problems. The great Indian mystic and philosopher P. R. Sarkar realized that spiritual teachings and social work were not enough to remove the root cause of much of today's suffering and injustice. He understood that much of this suffering was caused by a faulty socio-economic system. So in 1959, he introduced a new socio-economic theory called Prout, as he said, for the good and happiness of all. This all-inclusive social theory has a uniquely spiritual base, unlike past and present systems such as capitalism and communism, which are materially based and benefit only one section of society. Prout is not just for the wealthy and privileged, or just for the workers. It's for everyone, including animals, plants and the environment. Since the introduction of Prout, it has received praise from many of today's progressive thinkers. This video will explain some of the key economic principles of Prout. You'll learn why more and more progressive-minded thinkers around the world are studying Prout for practical and compassionate solutions to present-day economic and social problems. In this video, you'll be introduced to seven key economic principles of Prout. Guaranteed minimum requirements of life. Increased purchasing capacity. Decentralized planning. And balanced economy. The three-tier economic system. Cooperatives. Self-sufficient economic areas. Economic democracy. And non-material emphasis. Prout's economic system guarantees the minimum requirements of life to everyone. In most situations, this includes food, clothing, accommodation, medical care, and education. This guarantee can be achieved by ensuring full employment so that everyone has at least a minimum purchasing capacity, as well as ensuring availability and appropriate pricing of basic necessities. This means a minimum income will be part of the society's constitution. If you ask anyone in the world today uh, if it was morally justified that someone should die from hunger or cold or whatever, anyone would say no, no matter whether it was a head of a corporation or any person uh, in a small town. But the strange fact of the matter is, is that we actually live in a world where innumerable people are dying from hunger and from cold and from lack of the basic necessities of life. And capitalism simply uh, has not been able ever to provide everybody with the basic essentials of life and that system has to change and one of the the first say explicit statements of Prout is that Prout will guarantee everyone the minimum essentials of life. Once the minimum requirements have been met any surplus wealth will be distributed amongst those who have special needs or special talents. Those with special needs include disabled people and nursing mothers. Meritorious people with special skills or greater responsibility can receive bonuses and pay, or preferably will be offered items which enable them to deliver greater service back to the community. This will encourage personal achievements that also benefit society. For example, if the minimum necessity for transport is a car, some doctors who need to cover a lot of distance quickly may get a helicopter and just as there is a minimum wage to ensure the minimum requirements can be earned, there must also be a maximum wage to ensure the meritorious are not overpaid. The amount of minimum necessities should always be increasing so that the general standard of the people continues to increase. But of course this will also depend from community to community. For example, in some countries now refrigerators are considered a necessity. But in other places, a refrigerator is not a necessity and only special people who need it, hospitals or doctors, may have one. Similarly, in first world countries now, computers are becoming a necessity, whereas in other less developed places, computers are still considered a luxury or at least semi-essential. 
The relationship between the minimum and maximum wage may be set at a given rate. For example, if the minimum wage is $10 an hour, it may be appropriate to say that the maximum wage would not exceed $100 an hour, or 10 times that amount. This will help eliminate extremes in poverty and wealth. There are already examples of this tiered wage system in the world today. A firm policy though, that Credit Union abides by is that the difference in pay between the highest and lowest paid members will be no greater than three times. In summary, society's resources must first be directed towards ensuring that everyone gets the minimum necessities of life. The remaining wealth is then directed towards semi-essential goods and then finally towards non-essential or luxury items. All this is the practical expression of one of Prout's fundamental principles. There should be maximum utilisation and rational distribution of society's resources. Does Prout exist anywhere in the world? It does exist in the biggest economic unit of the world, the family. In a family, you first use your resources for providing essentials like rent, food, clothing, etc. Only if there's money left over would it go to non-essentials uh, or in individual needs like piano lessons or to buy a football uniform. Never at the expense of other family members' basic needs. But in capitalism this does happen. A few are allowed to get very rich while others die of hunger. If you want to understand Prout, then understand this concept of the family. Prout is the application of this family spirit to society and economics. To ensure that all people continue to receive the minimum necessities of life and to provide dynamism in the economy, Prout advocates a gradual and continual increase in purchasing capacity. To achieve this, there must be a continual increase in production through research and development and the appropriate use of progressive scientific ideas. Now, the, What's unique about his vision is that it wasn't anti-technology. So you have many movements talking about the future that technology has gone so far, let's avoid technology. Sarka was very clear that in fact you needed a vision of the future that had appropriate technology, that used technology, understanding that we had to have technology for the public good. He would use IT, he would use genetics, but start to see who are they benefiting, etc. So this wasn't a Luddite vision. Prout fully supports the use of science and technology, but this should never be at the detriment of the environment. According to Prout, plants and animals also have their right to existence science should be used to ensure a better environment and a better quality of life for all. Especially, science and technology should never be used just to create wealth for a few or for mass destruction, such as in warfare. It should be noted that under capitalism, less work, due to the advances of technology, means less pay, if not retrenchment. However, under Prout, it means less work for the same amount of pay. This fosters a much richer, happier, and more meaningful society. This increase in spare time creates opportunities for more rewarding pursuits that have little or no drain on material resources, like sport, art, adventure, science, religion, philosophy, altruism, and spirituality. This fosters a much richer society. People naturally want uh, an increasing standard of living. Uh, it's part of human psychology. Nobody likes to be stagnant, nobody likes to be in the same situation for year after year. So it is natural that people want in some way to improve their circumstances. And this psychological need that humans have uh, has to be recognised in an eco economic system and again has to be planned for. So Prout would plan for increasing the purchasing capacity of people. In many developed countries today we have seen the price of electrical goods actually drop while the quality has risen. Sound systems, televisions and computers are a few examples. Prout would apply this principle of increased production and quality to all essential goods first, thereby ensuring everyone has access to the minimum necessities of life. The fundamental contradiction of capitalism is that its driving force is greed and self-interest. So employees get less and less purchasing capacity and are re replaced by machines to maximize the capitalized profits. But this reduces the capacity of people to buy their goods and eventually results in the collapse of the economy, which is, in other words, called a depression. Proud, on the other hand, removes the possibility of depression by ensuring 
everyone has increased patient capacity, this keeps the economy healthy and vibrant. Economic planning under Pratt is decentralised. This means that decisions for the local economy are made locally and not by bureaucrats or politicians who don't have economic, cultural or sentimental ties in the area. The definition of a local person is someone who has merged their economic interests with the area. When local people are empowered to make the economic decisions for their own area, the outcomes will enhance their own economy and society. They will also have a greater concern for the environment if they're living in the area themselves and have to live with positive or negative environmental impacts. The principle of economic decentralization. This is important because it ensures that economic power, decision making, control over resources and control over the wealth that is generated through economic activity stay in the hands of local people, in the hands of local and regional bodies. Otherwise, if decentralization is not followed, there is a tendency for wealth to be concentrated into the hands of very few people sitting at the top of the economy, as we see today through multinational corporations and transnational financial institutions. Power is sucked out of local communities, wealth is taken out of the hands of local people, and decisions are made about economic uh, resources about economic activities by people far away from the needs of local people. Today, because of the internet, many people are able to work from home rather than in congested cities. Further advances in this type of science and technology will greatly aid decentralized planning and living. Inherent in decentralized planning is the concept of a balanced economy. Ideally, approximately 25% of the workforce would be engaged in agriculture, with 30% in agriculture-related industries. A further 25% would be in non-agricultural industries, with 20% in commercial activity and services. Proud believe the economy should be balanced. If one sector is too predominant, this is unhealthy. For example, some first world country exploit other third world country to meet their lack of agricultural or industrial goods. Proud divides the industrial system into three categories. Privately owned small businesses, medium to large scale businesses which are run by cooperatives, and very large industries which are concerned with key functions of the economy and are owned and run by the most local government possible. Examples of small-scale industries are businesses employing only a handful of people, such as family businesses or cottage industries. Often they are concerned with luxury goods and services such as jewellery shops, restaurants, small IT businesses, hairdressers and the like. If the business grows beyond a certain number of employees, predetermined by the community, then it will either stop growing or turn itself into a cooperative. This is to prevent monopolization or exploitation by a dominant business. Cooperatives only exist to serve a need for the local community or area. The cooperative would elect its own management committee, with the previous owner likely to be a part of the committee. Wages are paid to workers according to the work they do, using the system of minimum and maximum wage scales, with sufficient funds reserved for capitalization, development, etc. One thing is quite clear in everything that Sarko has written, and that is that the cooperative method of, of management and of, of owning wealth is the norm. And one departs from the cooperative system of, of enterprise uh, only for good reasons. Those good reasons might be that there are some types of enterprise, some types of production, which are so small that it's not sensible to organise them cooperatively. So far as possible, trade, commerce, agriculture and industry should be organised through cooperative enterprises. Only those enterprises which are difficult to manage on a cooperative basis because they're too small or too small and complex should be left to private enterprise. These private enterprises should produce only non-essential commodities or services. Similarly, enterprises that cannot manage as a cooperative because they're too large or 
too large and complex, should function as large-scale industries, as part of the public sector. They are generally structured to make a profit, decentralised, and managed as public utilities by the immediate or local government. However, they are always structured as autonomous from the direct management of the government of the day and function as statutory authorities. Some of these large-scale industries should be considered as key industries. Key industries should operate on the principle of no profit, no loss, and be centralised rather than decentralised. Examples include pharmaceuticals, raw material, and large-scale energy suppliers. Cooperatives have the potential to employ many more people than medium and large capitalist businesses, and at a fraction of the cost. In a practice system, the active support of both small-scale business and of cooperatives is a major factor in guaranteeing full employment. Cooperatives are central to Prout's economic system. Cooperatives bring about community prosperity and a sense of unity in a local area. Cooperatives foster the spirit of community and service, while capitalism fosters selfish individualism. Through cooperatives, the wealth of the community goes back into the community, not outside to company directors and their shareholders. If you're a director of a shareholder um, company, then your whole ethos is directed at the shareholders. You've got to provide the bottom line for them, uh, even to the extent where it might damage the company or damage the people who work for the company in terms of shutting down branches or whatever. But if you're involved in a cooperative, the, the whole thing swings the other way, and in fact you're there to help your members. Shareholder companies are there for the financial bottom line, whereas cooperatives are there for the community bottom line. Cooperative enterprises include producers, consumers and services co-ops. Those under the heading of producers' co-ops include farmers and farmers come producers. The cooperative sector includes 1. Cooperative enterprises 2. A range of various types of non-government and community groups and 3. The informal household economy. The cooperative sector produces all types of goods essential, semi-essential and non-essential and provides all types of services in contrast, the private sector is restricted to producing non-essential goods and providing non-essential services. Successful cooperatives depend on several factors including excellent management, ethical leadership and a genuine need in the community for the business provided. Many benefits stem from cooperative enterprises. The farmers, for example, can form producers' cooperatives and sell directly to a consumer's cooperative. This cuts out the middle person, which means a significant reduction in the end price. It also guarantees a good return to the producers, something that deregulation has not achieved. The farmers also maintain control of the packaging and selling of their product. I think the main benefits of the corporate system are essentially three. First of all, the feeling of using all your skills, not only a tiny part along an assembly line. Uh, secondly, the feeling of networking, that you network not only inside the cooperative but with the customers and across borders. And thirdly, an intense feeling of driving history forward, of being useful. And this not being dismissed as a garbage then ties in with the idea that the worker in a cooperative would work and stay in the cooperative far behind the usual retirement age. It's about people getting the confidence to do things they've never done before and to take that as a springboard to keep moving forward in their life. Under capitalism, cooperatives struggle, as the capitalist system often works to undermine their endeavours. However, there are examples of cooperative enterprises working in both small and large towns, like Milani, Australia and Mondragon in Spain. I think it's worth recognising that there's over 10.6 million housing cooperatives in Europe. A quarter of all housing for the last 20 years in Turkey has been done through cooperatives. In Norway, not a poor community, high incidence of home ownership, 15% of all housing is ho owned cooperatively. Czechoslovakia has 10,000 housing cooperatives. And in the United Kingdom, 2% uh, of all um, social housing stock is operated cooperatively. Marwick did a study of the 
the uh, UK housing cooperatives and came away with the conclusion that they were much better managed than strata titled units uh, and condominiums and that they generated a spin-on social effect that went beyond housing. And I think too this is one of the strengths of cooperative housing. Cooperatives form communities that build houses that then build communities. In summary, they can contribute very positively to deliberative democracy, to political accountability and to pr providing a very substantial and resilient counterpoint to, to globalisation. I believe that cooperatives are a genuine, viable alternative to government and private industry. I think they're the way of the future. Crowd advocates as far as possible the creation of self-sufficient areas, known also as zones. These self-sufficient areas will supply local communities with their basic necessities of life and form the basis of economic democracy. Where the area can't meet all the needs of the people, it can trade and barter with other areas. A socio-economic unit is a unit in which the minimum requirements of life can be provided to all the people living in that unit. Now, that means that it may be a country, as we know it today, it may be part of a country, a region, or it may be several countries together. In other words, we start with the needs of people, we look at how those needs can be best met to satisfy the productive capacity, the production and distribution of the requirements for those people, and then, accordingly, we demarcate the boundaries of the units based on factors like geography, climate, water conditions, agriculture, history, psychology, culture, all of these factors. And political considerations are virtually inconsequential in this kind of demarcation. Maximum utilisation of all human and material resources is necessary for local self-sufficiency. It's especially important that locally available raw materials should be the basis of local industries. Anyone can move to an area but only those who have merged their economic interests with the area can establish a business there. This will prevent outside interests, including multinationals, from coming in to exploit the area. In Proud, each economic zone is supposed to be self-sufficient. That means that outside interests won't be allowed to enter into the economic zone and establish their businesses and export the capital and the profits from that business to other areas. The benefits of all businesses and all economic enterprises within an economic zone, whether they're co-ops or small businesses, need to stay within that economic zone for the benefit of that economic zone. For example, if you have a small town, a Walmart will not be allowed to come in and set, set up a, a big business which will not only hurt the, the other businesses, the local businesses in that community, but they're also going to export their profits to Arkansas. For the success of self-sufficient areas, decentralization of planning and the economy is essential. This will bring prosperity and control back to local people as well as increasing quality of life and will aid in the development of more environmentally friendly industries and practices. Basically Proud supports centralized politics and decentralized economy. It's like a game of football. We have one umpire controlling the game but not playing it. The players only play the game but don't umpire the game. The umpire represents centralized politics and the players the decentralized economy. So politicians should be kept out of economics and the people should be given control over their economic lives. This is expressed in the concept of decentralized planning and economics. Concerning the environment, Pratt sees the economy, the community and the ecosystem in which it's embedded as one integral entity. One of the serious defects of capitalist economics is the attempts to abstract economics from both people and the environment. The end result is a breakdown of communities and a poisoning of the land. A proud economy, on the other hand, uses an integral approach, striving for sustainability and resilience in all three domains, social, economic and environmental. The importance it gives to socio-economic units or decentralized economy. This seems like such a radical concept for today because our world economy has taken over local economies. We don't have local economies anymore.
All of the six aspects of Proutist economics previously mentioned can be said to be components of an economic democracy. Economic democracy exists where the local people have control over their economic destiny. Political democracy has given people the right to vote for political leadership, but has failed to give them a real voice in the economic decisions that affect their lives. Modern society, as a result, is plagued with increasing extremes between the rich and the poor, with unemployment, chronic food shortages, pollution and environmental degradation, poverty, high crime rates, exploitation and insecurity. Economic democracy returns control over vital economic decisions to the people directly affected. Through this, everyone can enjoy the community's wealth and resources. It would, however, be a mistake to think that Prout is only concerned about creating an affluent lifestyle. The primary reason for Proutist economics is to provide an environment where people can devote more of their personal and collective efforts towards greater psychic and spiritual progress. It should be remembered that when Sarkar says Prout is for the good and happiness of all, he's not just talking from the physical point of view. Sarkar wants that once the basic physical needs are met, that our enjoyment is gained more from the creative, intellectual, and spiritual areas of life. This has three benefits. First, we can enjoy as much as we like without affecting the limited physical resources. Second, the quality of our happiness is much more lasting, not being dependent on the availability of limited physical, physical resources. Lastly, it takes humanity from a predominantly material level to a more intellectual, creative, and spiritual level. This is a major step forward in our human evolution. And really, this is, I believe, is the beauty and strength of Proud. And Proud also adds a spiritual dimension. And the beauty of the spiritual dimension is that we are all in it. It's not a question of how much money you have. Of course, you can have more or less depth in your spiritualism. But if I get more, the other guy doesn't get less. So it is a positive growth, positive sum kind of situation. I find that beautiful. One. The minimum requirements of life are food, shelter, clothing, education and medical care. Proud guarantees these by providing full employment and assuring that the basic necessities are easily affordable and available. Any surplus wealth is then distributed among the meritorious and those with special needs. 2. Increased purchasing capacity is achieved by assuring that the essential requirements of life are available and affordable for all. To achieve this, there must be a continual increase in production through research and development and the appropriate use of progressive scientific ideas. 3. Decentralized planning assures the decisions for the local economy are made locally and not by bureaucrats or politicians who don't have strong ties to the area. A balanced economy will be part of this planning so that agriculture, industry and white collar work are appropriately developed. 4. Prout advocates a three-tier economic system this is made up of privately owned small business, cooperatively owned medium to large business, and government run large industries. 5. Cooperatives are central to Prout's economic system and are the basis of economic democracy. 6. Prout aims to create decentralized economic areas that are, as far as possible, self sufficient. All businesses would be locally owned, so there would be no room for multinationals or outside exploitation of an area. These six points would help to create economic democracy, giving local people control over their economic lives and assuring their basic necessities. Society is then encouraged to pursue more non-material, creative, intellectual and spiritual forms of enjoyment, which will ultimately lead to real progress and happiness. Prout can never be imposed. It only works when people embrace it. Of course, Prout has its principles, but for their practical expression, that depends on the wishes of the society concerned. Communism sees people as workers. Capitalism sees people as consumers.
crowds, however, sees them as people with physical, mental, and spiritual dimension, all of which have needs that have to be met for a healthy, progressive society.